Hello everyone, uh, welcome to Tech Forward webinar. My name is Miloš Nedanović. I am a QA Automation Engineer and QA Tech Lead here at HTEC. Today I'm going to talk to you about API testing with JSON and REST Assured libraries in Java. Here you can see uh, the agenda for today. We're going to talk about why are we working on API tests, uh, what is API actually, uh, how to do a serialization and deserialization of JSON, uh, how we're going to uh, parse it using JSON library, uh, how we're going to use REST Assured for our requests, uh, some examples of the tests, uh, how to use the actual response that you get to compare with expected response, and I'm going to present you with some test failures to see how you can debug easily. Let's start first. Uh, why are we doing API testing? Uh, one thing is you want to send some data, you want to verify how that JSON response is going to look. Is it going to return expected data that you want? Uh, is the JSON structure that we get correct? Are the type of data correct? Uh, it is the only way to test the business logic of the application you're testing. Uh, if you compare it to UI tests, they are easier to write, actually uh, easier to maintain and faster to write. And of course, you can always use API test framework to support your UI tests, performance tests, or some other type of testing. Let's talk a bit about REST API. It is an application programming interface. Uh, it represents a connection between computer programs. And we can say that it's a standardized communication between the client and the server. So you send some request and you get a response. And the usual format that you get it is JSON. Uh, most common requests are get, post, put, delete. Here is one graphical example of API. Um, as you can see here, actually, let's talk uh, in some simple terms. Like when you're in a restaurant, you want to order something uh, off a menu, you send a request to the waiter who goes to the bar and then returns your order. That is how a API works, actually. So you send as a client, you send some data from your phone, let's say. Uh, it communicates via API with server, gets the info from database, and through server and API returns some response. So what is now serialization and deserialization of the JSON? Uh, it's, it's a conversion of an object that you have, let's say, in Java, and you want to convert it to a JSON. You, that process is called serialization. So it is an object in Java that you manipulate with. Uh, you convert it to a JSON file. And deserialization is reverse process. So you get a JSON, JSON file, from the database, and you now want to be able to manipulate it with it. So you need to deserialize it into a JSON uh, object or your class in your uh, API test, so you can better manipulate with it, like use getters and setters and any extensions that Java uh, gives us. So in order to serialize and deserialize JSON, uh, we can use a library for Java called JSON. JSON is an open source Java library developed by Google. Uh, it helps us convert Java objects into uh, that are you know, classes in its JSON representation and vice versa. What is great about JSON is that it supports Java generics and you don't need additional annotations. Uh, for example, like you need with uh, JSON or similar libraries. And you can write from and to JSON files. As you can see in my code here, uh, this is an example of a method that we can use to convert JSON to class. Uh, it expects, uh, the method expects uh, a JSON response from rest assured as uh, data and expects a class that you want to serialize into. Uh, uh, we can wrap it in a try-catch block to handle the exception. Uh, I'm using a JSON builder and two JSON method. Uh, so it, it gets my uh, JSON response. Uh, if it is, if status code is uh, 
over 400, it will fail uh, the serialization. It will return us the printout JSON and an error that we got. Uh, if, if status code is not above 400, we're gonna get an object. So what is important? We send out JSON response that we got uh, through rest assured. And we now uh, have as an output, we have a Java class. Uh, and of course, if serialization fails, it goes into a catch block. And we also print out the illegal state exception that we get. In order to communicate with API, we can use a rest assured library uh, to recreate the API requests and methods that we need. Uh, so rest assured is just gonna be a wrapper. You don't have to uh, uh, write it all over again in your code. You can just extract, get, post, put, or delete methods uh, in separate uh, class. And what you need is just to extract, make sure to extract the response. So you want to get the JSON response. And that's only why you're gonna use rest assured here. So now we want to uh, somehow unify JSON with rest assured. And we want to make sure to get the class Java object that we want. So remember, we talked about JSON. We have a method called convert JSON to class. It expects as parameters a JSON response that we're gonna get uh, using rest assured. Like here is an example, we're gonna use post method, send some body and send an API endpoint URL. And it's gonna be a rest assured rest assured actually is gonna be a JSON response. Uh, and we sent out a class, create user response, that is our Java class. So this create user response is a representation of the JSON that we want to get. If I open it up, it expects to have string name, string job, string ID, and string created that. This is what we know from the API documentation that we are using here. Uh, in order to do that, I need to have also a class that is going to be uh, a request class. We're, we're going to call it a create user request. In order to create or register user with this API, we need to send string name and string job as JSON. So what we have? We have a Java object that is a create user request containing uh, a string name and string job. We send some data to it. We send actual name and actual job, of course. And we now need to convert it to JSON. That is what our JSON library does. It hits then, rest assured, uh, sends a request to actual server. We get the response. JSON catches the JSON response and then converts it back to the Java class object that we wanted to. In this case, create user response. Let's go to the test itself to show how it works in real life. So follow me here. We have this create user request class. Uh, we create an object, a body that we, we want to send with post request. And I say, okay, here is name, it's gonna be Milos. And here is job. QA engineer. Then we build something that we call actual response. How we do it? We call method register user, which if you remember, it, we send body create user request with name and job. Uh, rest assured will convert it to JSON. We will get a response back and it will be a class create user response. So now I'm storing this response as a class. I'm storing it in Java memory as an actual response. So this is what we actually got from the server. And that's why we call it actual response. Now I want to compare it with the data that I expect to be. Uh, so I need to build on my own, a fake user response. Uh, if I go to a create user response class, 
I created a method course called parse created user. It can be also parse expected response, however you uh, feel fits best, best for you to understand it. Uh, and what I do, I'm setting a name and job from the body that, is sent, that I'm going to send to server. Actually, the one that is sent out to uh, server with actual request and response. Uh, what is the idea here? Uh, I have a body with name and job. And I want to make sure that that name and job is back in the response. So I'm creating a fake object. And that's why it's called expected response. I control here what I want data to be like. And then using uh, test and G assertions, I like to use soft assert because it will not fail uh, the whole suite or the whole test if just one data doesn't match. I'm using assert equals to compare name that they have in actual response and the name field that they have in expected response. And I do the same for job. I'm not gonna uh, run all tests to see how it goes. Okay, so the verify can create user that I showed you uh, works as expected and it passed. I created also a test where I expect it to fail. Uh, I called it verify assert will fail. What I did is I set the unexpected response, I set a wrong username. Instead of Milos, I set it and hard coded it to be made up name. So when I compare it with a cert, I will get an error, name didn't match. I see expected is made up name and actual is Milos. So this is how we make sure that our test actually works. Uh, in case that, uh, JSON returns error. Uh, I have an example where I sent out a wrong user ID when I'm fetching some user and I expect to get 404 and that's why I got what I got. It says a session error class get user by ID return status code 404 and error and then a JSON. So you can easily debug if something happens. And of course here if Endpoint is some um, uh, fake response, returns server error, is not a JSON that can be parsed. We will get an illegal state exception, meaning that a serialization itself failed. And we also get printed out message what happened. And we can easily investigate further. What we saw today is why and how you can use API testing to test business logic of your application. Uh, how uh, API, API tests can be used as support for UI and performance tests, how you can combine JSON and rest assured library to manipulate with JSON files as actual Java objects, uh, how to use actual versus expected response approach, and how to use test and G assertions. Thank you for listening to me. This was a tech forward webinar. My name is Miloš Nedanović. I am a QA automation engineer and the QA tech lead here at HTEC. Stay tuned uh, for our Q&A session and hope to see you soon. Hello everyone. Welcome back to Q&A session of Tech Forward webinar. My pleasure is to re represent the moderator for uh, gentlemen here who are uh, technology leaders and uh, QA automation engineers and uh, who gathered a lot of knowledge and they are willing to, uh, to spread it and, and learn us a lot of uh, interesting uh, wisdom nuggets in this area. So uh, uh, beside uh, having uh, Miloš, uh, who is presenter, we also have a Christian, who is a QA tech lead. And uh, I would like to ask you a couple of questions, guys. And we are going to expect the audience to, to write the questions and we are going to jump also into that part. So the first thing from my side is, uh, Miloš, is it hard to disseminate good practices? Because we heard a lot of good things, 
and I bet in a, you know, in the trenches, you see that things are a little bit harder than, uh, than usually. So which things you find really hard and can you tell us how you usually tackle that in your projects? Well, yeah, I mean, now it was uh, hard at the beginning. There were not many QAs, not many knowledge available on the internet. You were doing a lot of the things on your own, maybe doing it wrong because you didn't know better. But now that uh, worldwide and in Asia generally, we have a more better network where we can go working on uh, connecting people and having good mentorship programs and uh, regular knowledge sharing meetings where we uh, try to present best practices and to reach together some good practices as well. And uh, from this, let's say from this JSON and rest assured uh, uh, libraries that we built our API tests uh, here with Christian on the project uh, called Queenix, we were able to build it now as a template framework uh, for everyone in the company who wants to use it. So. Uh, mm -hmm. It would be easy for everyone to set a project like in an hour or maybe less. Uh, you just uh, you have everything set up. You need to add, add your classes, your endpoints, and you can start building tests. You all you also have live examples that you can see how they work and function. So it's getting better, yeah. and now it's easier to access knowledge. Yeah, and uh, yeah, you, you mentioned one thing that I would like to uh, to ask Christian about. I mean, generally you are technology leaders, and and in uh, age tech technology leaders are, uh, let's say, senior engineers who have on top of regular duties of senior engineers duties of standardizing good practices and disseminating knowledge. So, Christian, how you organize that within the company? Is it hard? Hello to everyone from my side as well. Uh, yes, yes, you are right. Uh, I mean, it's it's not too hard if you have a good uh, willing to do that. But uh, yeah, we have a lot of initiatives that we are working on in age tech uh, globally, let's say. And one of those is uh, JDP Academy, where uh, where we are actually uh, helping other people who wants to even do transition from some other uh, technology or some other uh, stack to our IT sector and to start participating in uh, QA automation. So we are helping people to learn new things and to join easily to, uh, to our, our QA stack. And uh, other, other processes that we are working in general uh, with people which are already uh, parts of our team are like a mentorship program where everyone is able to have uh, someone who, who is gonna help him with uh, learning new th things, but also with growing, uh, with uh, make that person m more experienced and to help that person to grow quicker than you know, if, then if you're gonna work uh, alone on something, it's not gonna be the same thing. So. We have a lot of people which are willing to help on that on that topic. Uh, other things are like uh, uh, currently we have some process for transitioning from manual to automation. So we are uh, helping and encouraging people to uh, switch from manual testing to automation. And we are doing our uh, internal workshops and uh, we are giving them lessons and all the stuff that needed for uh, helping them to easily switch to automation. And of yeah. course, there are other pro processes like blueprints that Milos mentioned, like audit program where we are actually going to have some group that is going to revisit uh, tools, processes, everything that is used on different projects in HTEC and to help them to make better test frameworks and everything. Yeah, and of course, many other processes are in preparation, and we have team meetings, workshops, talks about challenges and issues that we are trying to help people, but also to make others aware about solutions and issues that we are tackling, so everyone can know from where to find some some help. Yeah, now when when you mentioned that mentioned that process or development program, 
Now I'm curious, is that some uh, black box that just uh, get the input like a regular QA engineer and output the QA automation or, or how it goes? Milos, can you bring some light on, on that? Is it magic or not? <laughs> no, it's just uh, a dedication and motivation from people who want to become uh, automation people. Uh, so we just give them an opportunity for that. We give them uh, lectures uh, because what I always say, uh, manual QA engineer uh, and automation QA uh, engineer, the only difference is one is uh, programming automatically. Mm -hmm. Everything else is the same. We do the same work exactly and we have the same mindset. So now we want to provide to those people who want to learn automation and have maybe just basics in some programming language to get lectures on a weekly basis uh, for let's say three months and then uh, help them join projects where there is already automation set up. So we- And that development and, program is in internal HEC, right? Yes. Are you intending to make it in, uh, sometimes public? <laughs> who knows, maybe, or why not? Okay. I think it's a good program. Any learning initiative is yeah. okay for me. Yeah, yeah. Uh, now back to, to your uh, primary, primary topic. So, I mean, you, you mentioned uh, JSON as, as a library and which makes things easier, I guess. I mean, why JSON and, I mean, could you do it without it? Uh, we used to build API tests with only REST assured because it was uh, only viable and good library that had already built uh, HTTP protocols to communicate uh, through API. But there was always an issue accessing that response in data, like you needed to know uh, exact path uh, to some data that you expect. Uh, it was harder to send data as well. And it, you cannot manipulate with it. And it was difficult to assert things. You need to, you, you, will, you will not be able to reuse uh, as many things as we wish to. So when we were working, working on our framework, um, we actually got an idea from Android developers on our project. They said, we are using JSON, try it out. We know about some other libraries that do the same. Uh, we tried JSON and it worked, worked well for us uh, because it creates, like I said in presentation, it uh, creates uh, classes. It puts responses in your classes, they have attributes. Uh, it converts everything that is just a JSON file into something that uh, programming uh, can be done upon. Uh, it is a Java attributes, Java classes, and then you can do whatever you want. You can uh, wrap it in any method, uh, change data, uh, assert data, and anything else. Uh, it's, it's now just programming. You yeah. can easily compare, assert, uh, Actually, so no one thing. program test another program, right? <laughs> yes. Okay. Yeah, just to re remind uh, our audience to ask a question if you have any questions so we can directly see that here and we can answer. Uh, uh, Chris, for you, uh, I mean, sometimes it is hard to figure out those level of testing. And uh, since API testing is one aspect, we have unit testing, we have end-to-end uh, -end testing. I mean, how you position API testing and what is specific to API testing? Yeah, uh, in globally, first we could say that uh, awareness of automated testing has increased significantly in recent years, and uh, it's really nice and great to hear from management that you have a green light to do whatever you you actually can and would like to do in order to make uh, uh, your application more stable, more quality, and so on. So, if we are talking about our uh, our client for which Milos and I are working for the last years, uh, we actually set one goal there and it's to decrease regression time to zero. And uh, they recognize is, that- That is the goal. goal, I must say. I mean, it is yeah, really high standard. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's really high standard and they recognize that it's really important to uh, put all power that we can to achieve that. So basically what we did there and what we saw as uh, obvious flow for doing this is first to cover application with some light API tests that are gonna be uh, really fast and that we that will only uh, validate response structure, uh, uh, property types uh, uh, that required properties must have value and so on. And 
obviously we could do that on both mobile and, and uh, web APIs because there is no difference, both are services. So from backend perspective, it is the same and we covered both. Next step was to start writing functional backend tests that are really gonna test logic be behind the scene and it will be also faster than UI tests and easier for maintenance. So uh, after we finish that, then we, we actually can say that most of logic, if the case is that logic is uh, laid on uh, backend side, most, lo most uh, logic, the biggest part is covered yeah. and we can say, okay, our logic is working fine or not. But of course, without UI perspective or end-to-end -end tests, we cannot be 100% sure that uh, regression is reduced to zero and that we can just run tests and say that everything works fine. So at least we uh, we need to write uh, some basic or the most critical or the most used functionalities to cover them with end-to-end -end tests be because we cannot cover all regression uh, functionalities. There is at least one reason and it is mm. uh, maintenance and time needed for writing UI tests because those tests could be flaky and it will be more harder to maintain them than to just do manual testing for some, you know, edge cases if you don't have them covered. But yeah, the, the cost, the basic, cost they are plays the role, right? Exactly. Because they are expensive and not so reliable as an integrational engine. Yes, so return of investment should be calculated uh, correctly. Yeah, I believe this is a pro hint, like, uh, yeah, everything is, is fine regarding uh, like a theory, but be careful about costs. We have a yes, question. Just, to mention, one, yep. just to mention one really interesting fact from our project. Yep. That's that uh, developers are willing to help us with writing tests, but also they are comfortable with running our tests after they, are, they made some change to check whether they violated anything uh, or similar. So we are very happy to see that there are results uh, from one run that developer has run. So it's a great, great thing to see that collaboration and awareness of it. Yeah, you're right. Uh, we have one question from the audience. Uh, it is, it goes like, uh, which test management tools are you using at HTAC ATM and what frameworks libraries you use for QA automation? Also, uh, which programming languages you are using for QA automation as preferred? Uh, Maybe I can yeah. try to answer that. Um, it's not maybe a simple answer because uh, there are no limits. Uh, there are a lot of projects and a lot of QAs with different backgrounds and different specialties. Uh, well, we use uh, Java, JS, TypeScript. Uh, there are people who work here in C Sharp, uh, Python as well. Uh, what is your preferable? I mean, I, I believe you like it's Java. It's uh -huh, Java. Java. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> For now, it's only that. Uh, mm -hmm. um, I don't know, libraries. I mean, it depends. Uh, depends on the project, what you need to do. We have for end-to-end -end tests, we use mostly Selenium. There are people who work in Cypress. We have Appium for mobile. Um, there are people who use some libraries for uh, uh, GraphQL, so not just on API. Uh, for data science testing, you know, it's mostly Python. Um, it's really difficult to answer this one uh, because as a company, we don't have that uh, mindset that you should do only one thing, you do what's the best. I mean, even in our project, we uh, have a JavaScript uh, K6 tool uh, for performance testing because that was what we needed. That was what uh, served this pur purpose for our project. There are a lot of projects that use Gatling in Scala, even if their project is in JavaScript or Java. Uh, so Milos, but it is not that. expected from one person to know everything, right? It is, if I'm a junior QA automation engineer, I would say I have a primary language. And after that, I'm going to learn more if I, if well, I found use cases in projects. Uh, let's say yes, uh, in most cases, but uh, we try to teach people to think uh, what are they doing, not which tool they're using. Programming language okay. for me is also a tool. And I think every good engineer uh, with, will know how to do tests. If you know this principle, like compare actual with expected 
assert its data, how to prepare data. You can do it in any programming language. Maybe you just need time to read through documentation, try it out. Um, sometimes it's just a matter of syntax. There are, I don't think there are many uh, differences in programming in general between languages. Uh, the mindset is the same. Yeah. So you just need some time to adjust and learn. But I think you can do, if you know, let's say Java very well, I think you can do simple tests in other uh, languages. Yeah, the best language is one that you know the best. So <laughs> you can do of course. in any, everything. Okay, we can go to the next question we have also from the audience. So you guys worked on a QA competency framework. After implementing it now for some time, what are some of the key competencies you find most relevant for a QA team in teams of further development? So this is a tough one. Chris, would you like to try? Yeah, yeah. If if we have more time to think, the answer will be probably better. But on the first glance, uh, definitely something that probably is lacking to a lot uh, of QAs uh, is um, not only testing of API or end-to-end, -end, but also I think that really important aspect is performance testing and security testing. Okay, some some clients, uh, there are actually companies that are providing, uh, for example, security testing, penetration testing, and some companies, some clients are using those but at least for performance testing and that was actually our focus we had some uh, internal workshops and uh, we are trying to invest more time and more energy in uh, building our people competencies related to be eager or mm. well be, be be comfortable with doing uh, some complex performance testing uh, and uh, yeah depending of Another thing, depending of uh, willingness of people and uh, what what is your preference, uh, there are few few ways uh, or few flows where we can end up. <laughs> One is to continue, uh, you know, in technical aspect and to become really an engineer and an architect, solu even solution architect, but related to QA. QA world, for example, another way, and a lot of people from QAs, from QA department uh, are lately focused on uh, project management or product owner uh, role because, you know, QA is someone that knows complete uh, project that have, you know, wider aspect uh, or view of projects. So, in most cases, yep. it happens that naturally QA take more and more responsibilities and more and more roles and become become uh, product owner, product manager. And that's why I said, if we consider different competencies, it could be either those uh, leadership or it could be those technical, mm. where I mentioned performance security as the next step after, of course, uh, backend tests and API tests. So those two are really the most important at the beginning of. Yeah, and what is here really powerful is uh, in um, being aware of concept of competency and uh, practically for all uh, our engineers, we shape the knowledge and figure out who knows what and which things we should push more in order to be better engineers. And we do th that in, in controlled way. And that is really powerful mechanism because I mean, just um, going through the projects, uh, you can exercise similar things again and again and again. And uh, you as a tech lead uh, help uh, engineers to practically make uh, weaker uh, things stronger in order to have a, a better pro level of service uh, to, toward our clients. Okay, uh, next question. We have a lot of questions, so I'm, I'm trying not to rush too much, but I would like to address as more as we can. Why not simply use pre-build the rest assured method for deserialization? Miloš, any idea? Yeah, it's another way of using generic method for uh, deserialization of JSON, but yeah, I agree. It, it could be either that way, uh, but this way is also, I would say, the similar because again, we have generic method which accept whatever type of class and do the serialization in that class. So 
I'm not sure if that is answering your question or if you want more details, feel free to yeah, either ask, ask here or we can have some conversation because this well, could be interesting. Okay. Next one is uh, against which environments, when in a pipeline, do you run the tests? Mm -hmm. uh, okay, for now on our project, uh, we run them overnight using GitHub Actions. Uh, um, we you run them on test environment and staging environment. We don't run them for now in production. We don't see any value in that because we have releases that are bi-weekly. We know when they are, so we don't need to test production separately each day. Okay. Next, you use the Gherkin syntax on API testing project. It makes sense, um, test more usable and human readable. For rookies, it is more understandable. Yeah, that's a good one. Can you tell me something more about this topic? So Gherkin notation and all the black magic about it. I know that there are a lot of projects that use it and generally the BDD approach or BDT. Um, but I would like to answer more differently. Any test is readable to anyone if you write it correctly. If you name your variables and methods, uh, what they present, like if method, like test is, uh, you want to check if creating, let's say some post, if your test is named very that post works and you have steps that are, that use methods that are named correctly, it would be same as if you had a curtain. And that's what we try to achieve. Every test and every PR that we do, Chris and I, it's like even a spelling mistake. No, this is not, let's name this method more better. So we always uh, take into consideration that maybe our client or non-tech person wants to read this. They will not know programming language, but when they see the names, they can figure out what the test does. Yes, uh, just one addition. So one important thing that uh, we are mentioning all the time is that main test, uh, if you look at the main test for the first time, you should be able to read it and you should be able to do uh, to repeat it manually in application if you want to do manual testing. Just by looking in, in the structure of main test, you should be able to repeat that. So it should be, it should look uh, almost the same as test case. And that's that's something that Gherkin is also doing, but on the other way. Okay. And I believe we have uh, time for one more question. So Milos said that the uh, JSON is easy to access and manipulate with J JSON data. Uh, using only rest assured is hard. Does it mean if it is using JSON, I'm able to avoid uh, manual creating data transfer object class and object mapper to populate them? It's not that it is hard only using rest assured. It's not just about data. Um, you can. You can avoid, but you always need to prepare data. That is the point of QA. That is your work. You need to prepare data using, uh, uh, let's say, I will more say that with rest assured, it's not as easy to manipulate with them. Uh, if you send it, you need probably to build some hash map. Uh, uh, you don't have to do that with this. Uh, I mean, maybe there are more than one way to do things, of course, always in programming. You just need to, I'm not sure if I, answered correctly. Uh, said something right. And I, I believe you now touched the, the, the topic of data preparation and, and thinking up front, because when we work with some complex systems, let's say uh, oil analyzers or, or some uh, business uh, complicated calculations, it is really important to have a testing data prepared. And uh, I, I guess you invest significant time up front in order to execute everything, everything correctly. Do you have any comment about that? Well, or it's just hard. <laughs> no, it's not. I mean, it depends from project to project, from framework to framework. Mm -hmm. And personally, I didn't work with big data. Yeah. Okay. So all projects have their own shape and uh, and required knowledge and and yeah different requirements and tools that are best for 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 it. I believe we reached the end of of this session. So thank you all for participating, guys, tech leads. Thank you and thank 
all to the audience and for your questions. And uh, stay tuned. We are going to repeat uh, this series again, Tech Forward, uh, with some new topics that are, again, interesting. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye.